well, I may have recovered enough voice to help make the introduction here to conclude our 25th symposium. I could say we've saved the best for last. 24th symposium. I, I could say we've saved the best for last. And I'd be right. Um, when, when, <clears throat> Wendy Neither, her bio is listed in the program. You can find it many places online. Has had a career that spanned everything from data entry to CISO and many things in between. She's worked for small companies, state agencies, international banks, and now Cisco. She brings an incredible wealth of experience and a quirky sense of humor to everything she does. I've been privileged to know her for many decades, and uh, I'm delighted that she is here with us today to provide our closing keynote address. Before she comes up and gets started on what do we owe one another in the cybersecurity ecosystem, you know, let me say thank you to all of you for coming. Please plan on joining us again next year for our 25th uh, symposium. Um, our very first year, we didn't have one. So it's an off by one error. We're, we're, that should be familiar to anyone with software. Um, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. But don't run out yet, because here's the best yet to come. For those of you who made it this far, thank you so much. It's been a really long symposium. I know everybody's tired. Everybody wants to go have a drink. But I've just got to ask you one important question. Just, just one, as Tom Waite says. I want to pull on your coat about something. So what do we owe one another in the cybersecurity ecosystem? And, and by this, I don't mean... Um, you know, just what can we volunteer to do? Because we have a lot of that. We have a lot of charity operations in there or what would be nice, but what do we owe each other? And this is something that we don't really talk about. Nobody talks about civic duty anymore. It's a kind of an old fashioned term. But if you think about it, we are all walking around with loaded weapons in our pockets, loaded cyber weapons. Does that require some sort of contract, a social contract among all of us, not just the companies and not just the government? You know, we'll just let the government deal with this or not. But what do we as individuals owe? Not, and again, not just the people who work for companies, not just people in academia, but all the way down to our kids who are using this technology. What are their responsibilities? What do they owe? This is something that I've been thinking about since, uh, gosh, last year, sometime. Um, and it's more relevant than ever before because we are all discovering just how interconnected we are. Businesses are competing as, in, in, as ecosystems. We're not just individual pillars anymore doing our own thing. Uh, competitors are also partners who uh, are also sharing uh, other third parties and everything is getting passed around. Let's not even start on open source software, which is just one huge, you know, complicated web. They're not supply chains. They are webs of ecosystem because there's no end to the supply chain where finally somebody's receiving and everybody else is giving. No, we are all giving one to the other. And there's a, there's a joke that goes around in the security industry that it's the old joke about the two hikers and, and the bear, they see a bear coming and once the one hiker stops to lace up his shoes and the other one says, what are you doing? And he says, well, I don't have to unrun, outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. And this has become a really tired trope in the industry. Uh, this is another one of those things that I hate, you know, as long as, uh, as long as, um, 
Rob started out the morning talking about what he hated. It's my turn to talk about what I hate. Because thanks to automation and scale, there is more than enough bear to go around for everybody. You are not going to be safe by outrunning everybody. Bless you. So think about this. And also the fact that breaches affect a lot more than just the targeted organization. There's a great uh, series of reports that the Scientia Institute did together with Risk Recon, which is part of MasterCard, on the ripple effects of breaches. And if you Google that, Scientia and ripple effects, you'll read a lot of very, very interesting data about just how much, how many other entities are affected by any given breach. Anybody hear of Blackbaud? Okay. Okay, yeah, a, a, a few people have heard of BlackBaud, but really nobody heard about it except those who are using that platform before they had their breach. But they determined uh, with their research that the breach of the BlackBaud platform, actually now it's around a thousand different organizations that were affected, a lot of them nonprofits. And this is very serious because nonprofits, as I like to say, are the other critical infrastructure. If that, if if something happens to a nonprofit, people don't get rescued during natural disasters. They don't get fed. They don't get housed. They don't get rescued from human trafficking. If you think of all of the different services that nonprofits provide, they are also very critical infrastructure. And so if you can imagine the effect, the ripple effect of this platform that was used by so many nonprofits and they were affected by this breach, there were other organizations affected that didn't even know BlackBot existed. There was another case of um, Toyota had to shut down 15 of its production lines because of one small supplier that thought they might have a breach. They weren't sure, but they thought they might. So Toyota had to shut down its production lines. This sort of thing affects all of us now. And even more interesting from this study that Scientia and Risk Recon did was that more than one in four of the victims of those ripple effects had to pay breach costs, even though they weren't the ones that were breached, even though it wasn't their fault. They ended up having to pay expenses for that breach. So this is not just a case of everybody looking at each other and going, oh, wow, you know, that, that breach is bad. Uh, it's not us. No, we are all getting affected jointly by this. So as Nicole Perleroth talks about, you know, I asked her, how, what does she see as her obligation as a user of technology? From a cybersecurity perspective, she said, if I don't do this properly, I not only put myself at risk, I put an ecosystem at, re at risk. And she's also very concerned, as most journalists are, with protecting their sources. They can put their sources at risk, sometimes at risk of bodily harm or death. That's how important their obligations are to be secure. So shared risk requires shared defenses. And this is what we are talking about more and more, finally. Um, Chris Inglis said in, in one of his um, articles that the notion of a shared defense is a statement of reality, not of choice. I was in a, um, a round table with the Atlantic Council where he was present and I said, what do we owe each other? And he really liked that question. And he and Harry Kresa went on to write an excellent article foreign policy about the cyber social contract. In this case, they meant mostly what the government should be doing with the citizenry. And I don't think that goes far enough, but you know, this is their focus, so that's what they went with. But they also recognize that we have to stop leaving organizations to fend for themselves because it's just not fair. As I talked about earlier in the in the wonderful fireside chat that we that we had, I came up with the term the security poverty line because I went from working from a Swiss uh, at a Swiss bank to working to for Texas state government. 
I went from having a really big budget to having a really tiny budget. In fact, I had no budget. On my first day when I walked in, and I was the only security person, they said, hi, we need your budget request by the end of business day today. So I wrote down $2,000. I wanted a logging server and a couple of books. And the person I reported to scribbled it out and she said, where do you think you are, the private sector? So can you relate to this working in academia? Where do you think you are? Who, who do you think you are asking for this? So I had zero budget and zero people when I started at the Texas Education Agency. And I was better off than a lot of my peer agencies there because I finally worked for somebody who let me ask for an exceptional item uh, from the state legislature. And by the time I, I left that position five years later, I had a staff of eight. I had a, uh, another staff doing projects and I had a multi-million dollar budget. The others were not that lucky. So it was all chance at that time. So the security poverty line is real and I felt that it was important to talk about it because CISOs are not gonna get up on stage at RSA and say, yeah, we, we can't patch. Uh, we're having real trouble getting anything that we need. There are some things we just can't do. So I feel it's incumbent on me to be able to say these things for them that the things that they would like to say out loud, but they can't. So the security poverty line, it's not a real line. Don't go looking for it. It's not a number, but it is the line under which, below which an organization can't effectively defend itself. And if you're there, you know it. Uh, whenever I give this talk, I will have people come up to me later and say, yeah, that's us, don't tell anybody. So it's, it's well known and it is complex, which is why I called it poverty. It has many dynamics that are similar in some ways to real poverty. The things that they need, of course, start with money, but that's, it's not just money. Everybody focuses on money first, but that's not one of the real problems. They also think about expertise in terms of being able to hire resources, and that's, that's a portion of it too. But I'm gonna talk about the other two. Um, for the purposes of this talk, capability, what can they do even if they know what they need to do? What can they do within their environment? What are the constraints? What are the cultural norms that they have to comply with? And then influence. Um, again, Rob talked about being, a, you know, having um, organizations not being able to get their suppliers to fix things or change things. I had the same problem at TEA. Um, first of all, sometimes I had vendors who were so small, they couldn't afford to fix the flaws that I found in their software. Or they would say, well, you're the only one who's asking about this, so we're not going to do it. Or they, they would say, well, we'll fix it if you pay us to fix it. Now, working at Cisco, where I am now, if a supplier needs to fix something, we say, you, you better fix that. And they go, oh, yes, okay, right, because of our influence. But the vast majority of organizations out there don't have the same influence. They can't do it. Sometimes if they band together, as Rob was talking about, to exert more buying power, that can help to influence, but sometimes it doesn't. So first of all, money, can they actually afford the financial costs of tools and people? It's a simple question. We can't answer it. Expertise, do they know what constitutes essential security and how to go about implementing it? As Rob and I were saying today, we don't know that either. We actually don't know. So this was a question I, I asked, I did a research project as an industry analyst and I said, you know, I'm a new CISO at a 1000 person organization. It's my first day on the job. They've never done security, what should I buy? Just that, what should I buy? You're sitting in front of a blank Excel spreadsheet and going, okay, you know, what does this cost? So I asked a lot of people, um, a lot of security professionals. Some people named as few as four baseline technologies that they felt you absolutely needed to have. Some named as many as 31. And you can imagine that the one who's, ones who named 31 worked for a bank because they can afford to buy one of everything. 
I had one friend who said to me, that's a ridiculous question. That would never happen. Remember what I said about my first day at TEA? This happens all the time. I have friends who call me and say, I'm working as a consultant for an organization and they've never done security. What should I tell them to start with? There was one person who answered and said, well, you don't buy anything for a year. You sit down and you do a risk analysis. I said, well, that's great. We're sitting here without firewalls and, and you want us to just sit here for another year while you do a risk analysis. Lots of different answers. So even the experts don't know, they can't say with any certainty, what, what, what do you need? Everybody said that it depends, including the vendors. Now I took all of the different results and normalized them. And what was really interesting is that if you, if you normalize all the different responses, they kind of line up to PCI DSS, which makes a lot of sense because PCI DSS is designed to manage a very carefully scoped risk scenario across a wide population. It's managing the risk associated with a well understood formatted character string, the credit card number. And if you, for, if you scope this down enough, then, and you get prescriptive enough, you may be able to manage that particular risk. But again, that's not the same as managing all the risk across an organization or across an attack service. So the mini, minimum baselines pretty much lined up to PCI and they included firewalls and antivirus. Although there are a lot of people who say, oh, antivirus is dead, it's not useful. You can't not say it though. If you're making a list for, some, for an organization to buy, you have to say firewalls, you have to say AV because we never get rid of anything. And depending on whether you got open source software, free software, figuring out how many people you needed to run it and maintain it, you might be off by as much as a factor of four. This is what I figured out. When you're sitting in front of that blank Excel spreadsheet and going, what should I buy? It's almost impossible to go to a vendor and say, I have a 1,000 person organization. How much does DLP cost? Well, I don't know. It's going to take, take a sales meeting. Can we take you to dinner, buy you a steak? We have to ask you a lot of questions first. It's not just, you know, retail price is this. Okay. I'm going to write this down and you know try to get that. How many people do I need to run that if I have eight other technologies? How many people do I need in total? Very, very hard to figure out. And so I would argue that if we don't know what you need and if we don't know what it costs, how can we tell whether organizations can even afford to be secure? How do we know? And don't talk to me about benchmarks, please. I hate benchmarks. Because benchmarks are just telling you what your peers are doing. What if they suck at security? So let's talk about capability for a bit, even assuming that they know what they need to do. And expertise is not just the case of um, getting people and training them. Expertise is the combination of experience and knowledge and skills so that you know what to do with something you've never seen before. Which let's face it, that's, that's security every day. We go, wow, that just happened. Okay, now what do we do? So expertise is hard enough to come by, but then capability, are they blocked by logistics? Uh, one thing might be your company culture. If you are Google or something and you bleed to lead, you're more likely to get permission to get the sort of, you know, out there technologies that you want to play with. Oh, blockchain. Let's get five blockchains. Can we do that? Um, never disrupt the guest experience is a maxim in the hospitality field. You never disrupt the guest experience because if you do, they will go away. And on average, it takes them six or seven years to come back to your brand. So this is why you're not going to see things like disruptive multi-factor authentication in hospitality accounts or anything like if they want to log into something uh, within a hotel or within a resort, they're not going to do anything that upsets them and makes them, them go away. Uh, in telco, you never block anything. That's like should be the last resort because the whole purpose of a telco is to move the data, move the packets. So putting in any kind of technology 
where the 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 main purpose is to block things, it's very hard to sell. Uh, I know of one uh, one telco on the on the retail side of the telco company where they found out that they needed to upgrade the encryption on their point of sale systems, and they found this out because one of their peers got breached. And that was close enough to home that their executives finally said, okay, we're going to spend the two and th or three million dollars. We'll finally give you that money. But they also had to do 27,000 truck rolls to all of their locations, all of the retail locations where they had point of sale systems because they had to upgrade the encryption manually. So that sort of expense is something you're not going to incur until you're absolutely sure that you need it. I call this technique the, the cheeseburger risk management technique where, you know, you can decide you're going to eat cheeseburgers until your first heart attack and then you're going to stop. That's what many organizations below the poverty line have to do. They have to wait until the probability equals one and then say, okay, now we're going to do it. Now, if you time it correctly, if you do this just before you need it, you're brilliant. You're, you know, this is good business. You don't spend money until you absolutely need to. But if your timing is off, then you got the breach. And that's where, that's where lots of organizations get stuck today. So they're going to wait on everything until they absolutely need it. And it's amazing how high your risk tolerance can be when you have no money. So, yeah, we'll accept that risk. Sure, because we can't afford to do anything about it. And, you know, for security vendors like Cisco, you know, we better be good at security ourselves. Although Rob also gave an example of, um, yeah, uh, federal agencies who, for various reasons, have difficulty doing that sort of thing. But I absolutely understand it, having worked for the public sector myself. And it, it's another case of, you know, good stewardship of taxpayer funds. Of course, you're not going to buy anything you don't absolutely have on fire and can take the, to the legislature and say, look, we can't serve the citizens anymore because of this. Can we have some money, please? Because that's where we are. And the system's designed to be that way. That's the way we want government to operate, right? We don't want them to spend anything unless they absolutely have to. So these are sort of the dynamics that are causing security poverty that we don't you know, we look at the technology problems and say, why don't they do this? Why don't they spend enough money? Are they not aware of this? Yes, they are aware of it. They just can't do much about it. Really big dichotomy, safety versus security. If you're working in healthcare, any authentication you have that will keep doctors away from systems that help their patients is going to fail open. They're there's no alternative. They have to be able to get to their patient. As one doctor said, I don't want to see my patient dying on the gurney with his privacy intact. So, you know, wh whatever you want to introduce as a CISO at a healthcare organization, be prepared to get it thrown out or dropped at, at the last minute if, if safety is, is a concern. I had somebody contact me once and said, how do you do MFA in a sterile operating room? I thought, yeah, that's, that's pretty hard. You can't, you can't sterilize your phone. You can't sterilize a hard token. Can't use fingerprints because you got gloves. Can't use retinal scans because you got the safety glasses on. Can't do facial recognition because of the mask. What can you do? And then I thought about it and I, what's that? Why? Well, that, that's, the, that's actually part of the, the thing is that if, you know, if you have a sterile operating theater, you're going to have physical security around it to the extent that nobody who's um, not sanitized can get in. So if you have that protected an environment, maybe if you just have a login that can only be used on the endpoint in that operating room, maybe that's good enough. And I ran this by somebody else, a CISO at another healthcare uh, um, entity in Amsterdam. And she said, yeah, that's pretty much what we decided. Physical security, if you got it to that extent, you know, you don't have to get all fancy with all the tokens and, and all that kind of stuff. So these are the sort of capability things that every organization has to deal with. And a lot of them are different. 
most organizations have some sort of well-known security problem. I call it the Kraken. Everybody has a Kraken. They don't talk about it, but they all know what you're referring to when you, when you mention it. They're like, oh yeah, there's that big problem. Like there's that system we just cannot upgrade. Or there's this thing that, um, you know, the, the CEO goes and plays golf with this vendor. So we always have to get this vendor, even though um, their stuff is really bad. Everybody's got a Kraken in security that they have to deal with. And this is the reality of, of security poverty. I talked about influence. Can they cause the right changes in their suppliers and their stakeholders? Um, here's a really interesting thought by a friend of mine, Sarah Krisha, who is a, an Austrian freelance journalist. Two things happened within weeks of each other. The Berlin Wall fell and Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web. This started the vision of a global world where we would all come together, but now it's the internet of the many in the hands of the few. If you think about the really large technology companies, the private ones, if we want to return to a democratic state, we need to get it back to societal common ground. Which brings us back to the question of, if, if technology is democ, then shouldn't security be democratized as well? Shouldn't security be in the hands of all of us? And if so, what should we be doing with it? But good news, things are happening. Some of you will know Doug Song, who is founder of Duo, uh, Duo Security, did uh, a lot of other really cool things. He's off being a philanthropist now. And a skateboarder. He's an avid skateboarder. He builds a lot of skate parks. Um, first of all, I was really excited to hear about the, the first annual Cyber Civil Defense Summit that is being, being bankrolled by Craig Newmark of Craigslist that is taking place in DC in June, yes. Um, where they're really not just focusing on critical infrastructure, although that's a lot, a lot of it, but the, again, acknowledging the fact that we are all so interconnected that you can't, you can't divide our security risk into this sector and that sector and that sector as if they have no contact with each other. That they're all still interconnected. So I'm really excited to see what comes out of this summit. Another thing I was really, really thrilled about is the Consortium of Cybersecurity Clinics, where there are a lot of uh, institutions that are setting up community clinics where um, students of cybersecurity can get their hands dirty helping out small organizations with scoped limited security projects like implementing MFA for a small organization. And this is great because first of all, it gives the students a chance to see just how difficult it is to do this in the real world. But it's also great you know, for those organizations. And you, you can see everybody who's you know, involved in this right now, Indiana University and wait a minute, Somebody's missing from this list. Come on, Purdue, you might wanna get on this too, get in on this action. Um, but have, they're just launching uh, in the fall, the cybersecurity clinic at, at UT Austin. So this is, this is great. This is a great public good, but it's not enough. Again, this kind of falls under the, under the aspect of charity, which doesn't scale very well and it doesn't address the dynamics of security poverty, the things that keep organizations from being able to do something. If you pick something really small and say, yeah, let's do MFA for that, that's great. But what about the rest of it? When I built up the security program at the Texas Education Agency over five years, when I left, they started dismantling it because they had reductions in force, you know, all sorts of things happened and everything. Well, nothing happened, so I guess we don't need it. Um, this sort of thing happens all the time. In fact, um, I usually find that the number of people working on a security team at any given organization is at its highest about 18 months after its last breach. Because then the, the, the executives go, oh, we better build this up. And it takes about 18 months to build up the team. And then after a while, it starts going down again.
because everything's fine now, right? Everything's okay. So these are dynamics that are really hard to figure out. But I'm also really heartened at the national cybersecurity strategy where again, Chris Inglis and, and team um, all realize that they need to rebalance the responsibility to defend cyberspace from the smaller organizations that can't really do it to the larger ones who are in better shape. And again, I wanna emphasize that this isn't just good for the smaller organizations, it's good for the big ones too, because even if you're a big company and you're really good at security, you can still be affected by a breach somewhere else at another organization, either in your supply chain or adjacent to your supply chain, those ripple effects can reach you no matter where you are. So I think this is a big, big cultural sea change for our country. We are no longer saying, well, this is your responsibility. We're just going to, you know, the floggings will continue until morale improves. We're going to keep punishing you and regulating you until you get your, your stuff together. Because let's face it, yes, the basics are the basics, but if they were easy, we would have solved this by now. We're all really smart people. We can figure this stuff out, but it's an indicator that the basics are not simple or easy in security. So one thing that I would ask of you, being part of Sirius or involved with it, working in cybersecurity, don't just go for the sexy problems because we have some very, very basic problems that sound boring, but they're not getting solved. For decades, we've been saying the same thing, right, Spaff, over and over and over again. If it were just a matter of awareness, we'd have solved this by now, or a matter of sharing information. I worked for the retail ISAC, helped to stand it up, did a lot of information sharing. Doesn't help if you can't do anything with the information that you have. And we should stop looking just at banks or the military for examples of security. Let's look at Love's Travel Stops and see how they're doing with security. I know, but I can't say. But, you know, this sort of thing. Because if we were that good at this, we wouldn't be having security problems in our federal agencies either. But it's the same set of dynamics that we have to solve. So we want to start with the fundamentals, addressing the money problem and getting expertise, not awareness, because awareness, yeah. And maybe capability. So one of the things that I have been doing over the last three years is a research project with the Scientia Institute, trying to figure out what actually works in security. What practices produce the security outcomes that we want for our program? and doing this in as, in as rigorous a way as we can, considering that we have to do um, double blind anonymous surveys. And statistically looking at which practices appear to correlate with the types of outcomes that we, that we want to see. And we've done this, we're now in our third year, we're gonna be starting our fourth. One thing that we've found in the data year over year and it's not longitudinal because it's all anonymous, so we have no way of tracking it, but we're finding more and more that there's a strong possibility that architecture is destiny when it comes to security. If you do not have the right architecture, then you can't do some of the practices that our studies have shown lead to better outcomes. You can't do proactive technology refreshes, you can't integrate the technologies as well. If you can't integrate them, then you can't automate them. All these things, you, you also can't recruit and retain talent if you've got really old stuff. Nobody wants to be a DB2 admin for their entire career, Oops. right? Yes, that's true, especially if they bring all the COBOL people back, yeah. Mm -hmm. Your rates do go up, yeah. So if architecture is destiny and architecture really affects what you can achieve in, in your security program, then where does that leave the organizations that can't change their architectures or can't substantially change them? Is there a possibility of migrating from heritage environments? Let's not say legacy anymore. Let's say heritage 
It, I think it kind of sounds nicer. So we owe, you know, money. Here are some questions I have on security costs and spending. Is there a minimum amount? We don't know what every organization needs to be able to defend itself. And the open source isn't free if you need people to run it. It's cheaper in places like South America where labor is a lot cheaper. They use a lot more open source security software there because it's easier for them to get people at a, at a lower rate. But here in the States, we have organizations fighting with the vendors to hire the rare people who are getting upwards of 500K a year, uh, depending on which organization you're working for. This is something that, that you know, the, most of the organizations simply cannot do, and, and the federal government and state and local. They, they, can't, they can't beat out vendors for, for these people. Should some basic security controls be provided as a subsidized service? As I said earlier today, this works well in Estonia because they trust their government. So they've set up digital infrastructure, but talking about digital identity management here in the US, oh my God, everybody gets so scared so fast. And what security should be built in and therefore available at no extra charge? There are some platforms where you have to pay extra for logging or for a certain amount of logging. And of course, you never know when you're going to need those logs or at what level. Almost nobody logs regularly at a debug level, which is what you need when you're doing a forensic inv investigation. You can only turn it on afterwards um, if you're pretty sure the event is still going on. So here's some questions to think about. I mean, any of these. Yeah, here you go. Research project. Um, in terms of expertise, I think that security products should be designed to require less arcane expertise. You like your command line, you can keep your command line. But for everybody else, if you've got 20, 30, 40 security vendors, the people who are using your tool are not going to be spending all day admiring the dashboard and clicking on everything. They have a job to do, a problem to solve. They want to get in, they want to solve it, they want to get back out again. And a lot of organizations, what was it um, Rob was saying today about you know, a lot of the, the vast majority of, I think it was the water utilities, they, they all, you know, a lot of them just share one part-time IT person. You know, you, you can't give them 30 different security technologies. There's no way they could run that. And visibility and transparency are great, but you have to know what to do with, when you with whatever it is you receive. Um, you have to support all entry paths into cybersecurity, including liberal arts, representing here everybody. We cannot just train everybody to start as a sock monkey and then move them on into you know, some other kind of cybersecurity career. There are so many ways to approach this problem. There's room for everybody and all backgrounds. And this is the controversial part, you know, turn off the, the camera there. Stop the market-driven concentration of expertise in those vendors who can outbid for talent. Um, because if you can't get that expertise for your organization in-house, it's gonna cost you a lot. Um, not everything is volume discount driven in security. Uh, there's a balance there between expertise and and warm bodies to look at scrolling logs. So capability, uh, I just mentioned the security outcomes report, which is the, the, the uh, research I was talking about that I'm doing with Scientia. And you know what leads to security resilience, that was the theme that we did this year. First of all, we had to figure out what organizations meant by resilience. To me, resilience means being able to respond and recover or operate at a diminished capacity, but still be able to operate in the face of an event. But uh, most, of the, um, most of the professionals we surveyed, the majority said it was pre preventing those incidents in the first place. That was their definition of resilience. Well, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that, but that's what they said. So this is one of the problems that we have is, you know, even, even deciding what constitutes resilience in security, figuring that out. So can we build architecture standards to help with those security capabilities? Do we need to, to build from the ground up? 
say you cannot be effectively secure if you don't have the right underlying architecture. That would be a really cool project for somebody to do. I'm just saying, you know, I would I would bring you pizza like, you know, or tacos or whatever you like all the time. If you could look at this, uh, we need vertical specific reference architectures. I know that NIST does some of this, but uh, and, and MITRE does some of this as well, but it would be really good to help with business and culture constraints, not just say, you know, this is what everybody should have, but yeah, you generally can't do this in aviation, so you're going to have to do it this way. As a friend of mine who was CISO at American Airlines says, fail fast is not an option in aviation. Um, last time I heard him speak, basically, in order to change the software on a plane, you need to have the plane on the ground, one person in the front of the plane, one person in the back, and one person on the tarmac in order to change the software. This means you do not patch quickly or easily. You've got to be very deliberate about how you do that. And is there a shared responsibility model that we can agree on? What's a famous Tyson quote? Everyone has a shared responsibility model until they get punched in the logs. Yeah, we still haven't solved that problem either because it's really a matter of the vendor and the customer going, yeah, that's yours. We're not doing that part. That's you. Yes, yes, that too. And then influence. What kind of incentives can we build into our systems? And this isn't necessarily regulation, although, you know, it's never off the table. Um, that's, but what other kinds of components, linchpin components of the security ecosystem do we need to get a hold of? I've been part of those policy discussions as well. Um, who knew solar winds was a linchpin? I don't know. I mean, certainly Active Directory is, but you just never really know until you see the ripple effect when something goes wrong with it. Um, also, we need to balance the risk-driven regulation between the biggest and the loudest participants in public policy, which are usually the banks, and any large vendor who has a big enough stake in the outcome, and the rest of the community. We need to bring the love's travel stops to the table every, and everybody else. All the voices need to be heard because it's all, generally only the ones that can afford to send someone to RSA who get to talk. And we need to be able to fix that. And we have a massive multi-stakeholder, cross-border, military and civil cybersecurity policy problem, but that's too long to get into now. Here's a great quote from Kieran Martin. This is where I kind of end up too when I think about it. I think we need to think about cyberspace as an environment where we increasingly live and work. So that means we have obligations to each other. We have obligations to look after our bit of the digital environment. We have the obligation not to be digital pollutants. Is this starting to ring a bell with anybody? It's starting to sound familiar. We have the obligation not to allow bad things to happen on our patch. We have the obligation to work in our personal and professional lives to help clean up the dig digital environment. So I'm just saying this may be as complicated as battling climate change. In fact, I think it is. I don't think we understand the problem well enough yet. I certainly don't. Um, but we need to, because if we want to leave next generations or these generations a safe and secure internet, I think we all have to do our part, but it's a pragmatic as well as a moral imperative. Thank you all. Any questions? Are we, are we ready to go? Please oh. use the mic. Use the mic. I got here first. So uh, I'm going to get back to your question of as a CISO, a new CISO, where do you start? And I, I would propose that you start with the one thing you know you'll need. And that is insurance? your, that no, is kidding. your plan, your, you know, your plan, 
for dealing with the breach, your plan for dealing with something when it happens, uh, is, is that a reasonable place to start? Well, if you have not done security before and you need a plan to deal with, I, I agree, it's really important to have a plan for incident response, but I would be going, well, I got a fork. You know, uh, right now, all I have is fork. I don't know what I'm going to do if there's an incident. There might be an incident right now, and I don't know. So the way I have started when I've built up capabilities as a CISO in different environments, first looked at what people were already doing that could constitute security. The networking people, do you have anything that looks like or acts like a firewall? How's it configured right now? And start to bring those capabilities together. And then I would absolutely agree that say, at this point, with these resources that I can tap or maybe not, because I have to bribe a lot of people to get those resources allocated to me, you know, this is this is the way in which I could theoretically respond to an incident. And you update that every year and say, now we have new resources. We have, a re you know, somebody on retainer. We have, we can call this and that and the other thing. But yeah, from day one, um, I don't know what you would say that you had to be able to respond to an incident, except maybe a phone list. I'm still on the phone list for TEA, by the way. And that was like 22 years ago. No, 12 years ago. <laughs> I'm sure somebody rotates it for me. <laughs> That's good. Um, in regards to, you know, what some of these vendors should do, et cetera, et cetera. Has there been any thought or any action on implementing something like the CAFE standards for the automobile industry, identifying things by function instead of literal requirement? I can, oh. I can remember when cars, you know, I helped my father as a teenager install seat belts in a 1965 international scout oh, nice. because they were now required yeah yeah you know and you could go and get them you see the changes that have happened you have airbags you have anti-lock braking things like this you had a government mandate that said you have to have this type of a function in there mm -hmm. has there been any thought of trying to do something like that to where people have a function where if they can meet the standard then it's good um I don't know myself, but I can I can speculate that the big problem with that is that there's an almost limitless permutation and combination of functions that you'd have to be able to define. Mm -hmm. You're going to need to be able to do this with this thing in this circumstance, but if that's not the case or the risk is not that, then you need to be able to do this. And so I, I just think, you know, we, we've stuck with technology so long as the prescriptive list, which doesn't work and has to change yeah, all the time. It, it but, you know, I know a lot of people are trying to define outcomes, outcome driven I, I wasn't legislation. So much thinking of outcomes, but more like like function. Uh, this exactly. thing turns the thing that turns yeah. the other thing it, that stops like, the if thing. If you do this, then yeah. you have yeah. to keep this from happening. The mechanism yeah. is up to you. Yeah, yeah. And if we could be as prescriptive and concrete with security as we could with a car i think we could do it but and face it there are only so many ways you can you're allowed to build a car these days so some of those constraints are already built in and we've resisted doing that in technology to say look stop reinventing this we already have wheels that work perfectly fine you don't get to work on wheels anymore um you know and somebody will be very sad because wheels were their their uh, dissertation so um Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, you know, or say, "I'm hey, I'm going to disrupt everything." Yeah. Well, good for you. When's the last time we had any kind of industrial revolution or any kind of revolution where somebody was really proud of breaking it? Uh, they actually, uh, th they did not break things, but they were uh, they objected to the misuse of of that technology. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. All right. Next. I actually got one question for you and I kind of got open-ended question. Uh, you talk about, and I've, I've had over years, I've had to deal with a lot of public sector, small hospitals. And yeah. I've, in my role, sometimes I'm acting as a virtual CISO. And one of the things I'm trying to put together some thoughts on, we all know the what. We've got NIST CSF, we've got HIPAA security, we've got all these frameworks and 
I go in, most of people will know, a lot, a lot of places I go in, they'll know, yeah, I know we don't have any disaster recovery plans. We don't have instant response plans. And part of it is money. But what other corporate governance, when I say corporate could be organizational, governance or cultural issues do you see that are, are resistance to change to say, well, we know we need to be here, but a year later you come back and they have made no progress. And I, in some cases, it's organizations I know have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. They're making money hand over fist. But from your experience, what are some of the cultural or uh, governance restrictions at the highest level of the organization that restricts change? Um, it's not change at per se, because if there's a really good business reason for change, they're, they're going to be all over that. Reorg, yes, we can reorg everything. Um, so it's not really that. I find that in any organization, if you find something in security that sounds like it's really stupid and you start pulling on the thread, eventually at the end of it, you will find something, a decision that somebody thought was a really good idea way back when, and it probably was a good idea. It, it might have been their only choice back then. But now, of course, it doesn't serve them and they have to go fix it and everything. But, you know, I would just challenge you to to go to any large bank and say, say to the, the security people, can you get access to all the logs you need? They can't do it because some organizations are just so big that the logistics of doing a broad horizontal security operation is, is prohibitively difficult because they've all been working in silos, or as I like to say, cylinders of excellence. Um, they've all been working in those for so long, which is one reason why the zero trust model or the zero trust framework is difficult to implement because it requires horizontal cooperation among the endpoint people and the mobile people and the network people and the application people. And they've never done that before at the security level. So, you know, organizational dynamics or constraints like, you know, I've talked about, if you don't run your own network, you can't put in firewalls. Uh, if somebody else runs them, they won't put anything on their firewall for you to use to monitor them, all, all that sort of thing. So it's a combination of, of all sorts of constraints because you're right, a lot of those organizations have tons of money, but they will decide something like, you know, the cloud group wants to put authentication in the cloud and the rest of the organizations are saying, no, we, we absolutely must keep everything on premises because we had that one bad experience with a cloud authentication vendor one time. And yeah, that's, that's why you have people rotating in and out of really big organizations because they just can't get the stuff done. So it's very frustrating for people. Anything else? All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Wendy. Get out of here. Thank you for coming to the symposium. Joel, you going to take us out? Thank you. We um, semi affectionately, meaning we, the staff of Sirius, affectionately call this uh, Hell Week. Uh, it takes a lot of planning to get here. Uh, Saturday, we hosted the CyberFire student event. Uh, Monday, people started arriving and we had great meetings with people who were arriving and wanted to do side meetings and talk about new research initiatives and student recruitment initiatives. Tuesday, Wednesday, the symposium, the party last night, we have our board meeting tonight. Tomorrow is the Serious Strategic Partnership board meeting. Friday, I think we get to uh, Friday, we have a staff meeting to read to decompress and talk about this. So it is a rough week on it. And it is not uh, possible without all of the staff involved. So uh, from from uh, on behalf of Don Young staff and myself to all the rest of the staff, thank you very much for all your initiatives. But the worst thing that could happen is if we plan something and nobody shows up. So I want to thank all of you for attending this event. Uh, the feedback throughout the event is always nice to hear people find things that they enjoy. They really like the speaker. It's great to see the student posters, those things. Uh, please continue to tell us what you do enjoy. We make sure that we continue those things or we look to duplicate them. But please also let any of us know that you think that we didn't do uh, as well as you expected or things that you think that we should be able to do better. We want to continue this, uh, this event and make it uh, bigger, better, and more useful uh, every year. So talking about the future, mark your calendars now, uh, April 2, 3, 
uh, in 2024 will be the 25th annual uh, Serious Cybersecurity Symposium. Uh, and, and while I yet don't know who will be speaking, I anticipate it's going to, anticipate it's going to be a fantastic event, and we hope that you're, you're part of it as well. Um, for any of you who came to any of the Sirius staff and said, hey, I'd like to follow up, or I'd like to talk to, or can we learn more on, uh, that's fantastic. That means that we are engaging you. Just please recognize that, that, that I myself have had probably a dozen or more of those conversations likewise. And so we may forget. So please, 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 if you, if we told you we were going to do something or you wanted to engage some, please drop us an email so that we don't overlook at it and month from now go like, hold on, who had questions about whatever that I said I would send that white paper to. So please send us a reminder so that we can follow up with you and get you the information you need from that. This is our annual signature event. This last section was also plays double duty. It was simulcast because it is part of the weekly serious security sem seminar. Uh, SPAS started doing these doing before Sirius was established, started doing a weekly security seminar. Uh, by the way, they're online all the way back to either 1999 or 2000. It reads like a who's who in cybersecurity. So take a look at those. Uh, it, it is amazing. You can keyword search on our website, our YouTube channel, those things like that. But next Tuesday or next Wednesday at 4.30 Eastern time, there will be another seminar. We will take a break during the summer because it is an academic year thing, but then in the fall, we'll start up. So uh, feel free to tune in absolutely every Wednesday for great talks. And if you would like to be a featured speaker, please send us uh, an idea of your title and your availability. And if it aligns with what uh, we're looking, we would love to slate many of you to give talks uh, throughout the idea. Anecdotally, this is a four credit. It's Computer Science 591. So there's students enroll in this class. And I, and I truly believe that one of the reasons why the educational component of, of Sirius and Purdue and cybersecurity is so highly rated is because every week we have somebody in industry talking on the very broadly defined area of what cybersecurity. Um, it's not every week on access control or every week on crypto it's it's every week it is a different subject within this area and i think that's to the benefit of our students to hear from all these things if it even if it's not an area that they're going to work in um we had t-shirts produced that just said cybersecurity is a team sport and i believe that and so the more that you know even though the areas that you're not going to work directly in, the more that you know about what your peers and your future company or academia or research you're doing or the government office it all plays well. It is a team sport. With that, unless any of the staff catch something that I have forgotten to say, thank you all. It was great having you here on campus, and we hope to see you before next year's event. Thank you.